Hi, I'm Ken Jacobson, Senior Documentary Programmer, AFI Festivals. Welcome everyone. We're absolutely thrilled to have with us for this Q&A, Peter Kuhnhart, the Director of Obama in Pursuit of a More Perfect Union, and Executive Producer Jelani Cobb, who you've also just seen in the movie. Our moderator for this conversation is CQ Roll Call's Deputy Editor, Jason Dick. Jason Dick is also the host of the Political Theater Podcast, a native of Arizona and resident of Capitol Hill. He has also worked for, national, for the National Journal and was an AmeriCorps volunteer in West Virginia, as well as a teacher in Arizona and West Virginia. Jason, thank you so much for moderating this conversation. Welcome to AFI Docs. Please take it away. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I appreciate the intro. And uh, Peter and Jelani, I just want to congratulate you on a just a, a really well done job with uh, with this documentary series. I mean, the, the the breadth of it, you know, I mean, we, I, th I think that uh, most people who are kind of political junkies or documentary junkies have seen something about uh, the Obamas or President Obama. Uh, but this has a real depth uh, in terms of the, the biographical aspect and the political uh, uh, aspect too. And I, I just want to the, the framing device for which uh, you, you, you put the film together with the, the, the speech is, is sort of colloquially known as the, the race speech uh, that Obama gave uh, during the primary in 2008 when um, he, he, he felt he needed to address this head on uh, with uh, Jeremiah Wright uh, uh, coming into the limelight and also some of the stuff that was going on in South Carolina. Uh, Peter, let me ask, start with you uh, about what was what went into the decision to, is that how you wanted to organize it from the get-go around that, using that, the speech as the frame for this, uh, for this story? Well, the, the, the decision to begin with the speech came a little later, but the decision to look at Obama's life and career through, through the lens of race came at the very beginning. And we, I should take you back. We started this project seven years ago when Obama was still president. And at that time, the issue of race was something that nobody in the administration wanted to talk about. It was like the third rail that uh, every time it was brought up, something kind of went haywire. So my feeling is that time was on our side and the fact that it took as long as it took to make this film liberated us and allowed us to talk to people around him about the, 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 the issue of race and how it impacted his life and his presidency. Uh, so race was always the central figure in this, in this project. And Jelani, uh, you're you're a staff writer at the New Yorker uh, and a and a professor of journalism at Columbia University. You've been um, you've been chronicling uh, the the politics of Barack Obama, the politics of race for uh, for most of your career. I remember the first time I heard your voice. It was, I believe, on a podcast. I mean, I can't remember. I know you've done a, something recently on The Ringer. Uh, it, it was way before that, though. Uh, but what was when did you when did Obama get on your radar? as an observer of these mm -hmm. issues. Uh, you mentioned that uh, when, when you heard his DNC speech in 2004, it, this is in the film uh, where, where you, you say like, of course, of course there's a black America and a white America, regardless of that aspirational, but had you heard about Obama before then? Yeah, I, I'd heard about Obama prior to the 2004 DNC speech. Uh, and, you know, there was this halo around him uh, and, you know, this, uh, just laudatory uh, stream uh, of compliments, you know, that were associated with him, uh, which I was primarily hearing from white people, you know, if I'm honest about it. And it made me skeptical of him uh, because, you know, I thought like, okay, transactionally, uh, what exactly is happening, especially for this black person uh, to be so widely embraced by and wildly popular uh, with so many white people and, you know, is a person in that position able to actually be a credible, credible representative of black interests? And when I heard the DNC speech, I both had increased reason for skepticism and increased reason for endorsement. <laughs> you know, uh, he was a far more complicated and uh, compelling figure than I had anticipated. Uh, and so the DNC speech was the first time I saw him in any extended light. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Mattis only grew. He it was greatly complicated what I thought of him then and 
that was the defining trait of, I think, his presidency, uh, that things only got more complicated as time went on. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I was thinking about Al Sharpton's comments uh, uh, during the campaign, and, and this is also documented, Peter, in the, in, in, uh, the, some footage you have of, uh, of, of Reverend Sharpton, where he says that the more, he, he said that he, he just didn't want me to hurt him. He didn't need my support outright, but he didn't want mm -hmm. me to hurt him. Mm -hmm. And that was also, he said, like, the more that I talked to him, the, the more I heard that he didn't want to, he wasn't going to tell me what I wanted to hear which mm -hmm. was, it sounds kind of like what you're saying, Toronto, mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. and, and, I, and I also think that, you know, one of the most brilliant things that he did in 2008, which I don't know if we'll ever see anything like this, uh, was almost to, you know, kind of make a football analogy uh, where this is a person who, you know, receives the ball uh, at the five yard line and there's nothing but defenders, uh, you know, in front of him and, uh, and it's just navigating, you know, there's the civil rights establishment, uh, there's the democratic party establishment, uh, there's the general public that's skeptical of him, there's, you know, people who realize immediately that Obama rhymes with Osama, you know, like there's no reason to believe that this person is going to be able to make any headway and just as a political spectacle, I mean, it was just astounding to see. Uh, and so even the, the commentary that uh, Al Sharpton made uh, about saying that you know, he didn't want him to hurt him. Uh, and I think people at some point came to the, the realization that uh, as he grew in popularity, it would be injurious to themselves to attack him. You know, you saw the civil rights establishment recognizing very quickly uh, that Obama was in some instances, uh, and the, this Congressional Black Caucus for that matter, uh, in some instances, Obama was more popular with their constituents than they were. And that was an astounding thing to see happen. And Peter, uh, you mentioned that this, this project took years, you know, to, to, to pull together, um, which, I mean, it, it, it feels like a years long project because of just the depth of the coverage you have of him as a young man at the Harvard Law Review and so forth. Um, and then there's no way that you could have planned uh, this, but, you know, this film is arguably more relevant now than when Obama was president because of what we are dealing with as a as a country, uh, we've, we just recognized the, the one year mark of George Floyd's murder uh, in Minneapolis, the hands of police officers. Uh, Joe Biden just recently went to Tulsa um, in, in to mark the 100th anniversary of the, of the, the massacre of, of, uh, of black citizens there. Um, and, 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 and Donald Trump brought race to the fore as an antagonistic weapon in politics the last four years. What was going through your mind as you're in post-production for this, uh, for this, you know, really gargantuan kind of uh, undertaking? Well, we, we were as surprised as everyone on election night when Donald Trump was elected. I mean, I, I, you, you'll probably remember Obama's uh, astonishment that that next day when he was being interviewed and he just he looked like a deer in the headlights that that, that he, he just never conceived it would happen. Um, we we began the project with his cooperation in anticipating that Obama was going to give us a series of interviews. And because his last two years were so jammed full of activity, we never got to it. He left the office. He ended up going to Netflix. And so he became off base for us. But he generously told his friends and colleagues to work with us. And so we interviewed 40 people who uh, either knew him or worked with him or went to school with him or uh, had some connection. I think had we interviewed those people back in 2012 or 13, uh, we would have had completely different interviews. The, 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 the word would have gotten out, you know, avoid this, stay away from this. Uh, I mean, you've got to remember when you, when you mention these, these terrible racial incidents that are happening now with the George, the, the Floyd story, uh, Trayvon Martin kind of ushered that in and, mm -hmm. and Obama, you know, just for saying a simple line like he could have been, been my son, uh, triggered a whole national conversation. So uh, 
You're right. It, it, this this film does have more import today than it would have had. I think I think we now know where we're going. We saw what Obama's presidency unleashed. We saw the fact that kind of the hatred that was bubbling beneath the floorboards rise up and uh, and and come to the forefront. So I think we're much more realistic today about about how much. Uh, racial unrest and hatred and white white supremacy and anger is floating around this country than we were when Obama was still in office. And Jelani, I, I um, as a as a journalist um, and and someone who you know was able to observe Obama up close. Um, I mean, I it, I wasn't in the White House Correspondents Association at that point, but it, covering him in Congress and so forth. I mean, we, we know, you know, when you see people up like front, uh, like they, they get more complicated, as you, as you said. Um, I, I was just wondering what you, some of your reactions to, uh, you know, like the Bobby Rush uh, comments uh, that, that were, um, you know, again, Obama is a transcendent political figure in our history, in world history. And Bobby Rush is still pissed <laughs> about 2000, it sounds like. <laughs> sure. I, I mean, I think, you know, Bobby Rush was, was really interesting you know, because he knew him uh, in a way that nobody else did. He knew him as an antagonist. Mm -hmm. uh, and not only that, he knew him as someone whom he had defeated politically. Uh, by, a lot. Was, <laughs> by, by, by a lot, by 30 points. By a lot. But but I think that, and you know, and Rush pointed to, I think a reality that, you know, I tried to get at in the film too, which is that people thought of Obama as, Kind of meta political. They certainly thought of him as meta racial, uh, but they didn't realize that he operated on the same sorts of prerogatives that any other politician operates on. You know, my friend today may not be my friend tomorrow, and that's exemplified, you know, by the Bobby Rush uh, situation. Uh, and at the same time, I think that it's crucial to show something else about Obama, which is that. Uh, you know, Bobby Rush's, you know, victory indicated a soft spot in Obama's support. And, you know, the, the kind of completely adoring, um, vehemently protective relationship that he ultimately cultivated with Black America might not have been possible were it not for the fact that he lost in that race against Bobby Rush. Uh, and it says something about who he is as a political figure uh, to be able to understand that, to be able to assimilate that information and then be able to move on in a way uh, that allows him to do the exact opposite, uh, to become this person whose black identity is complicated. It's maybe a typical, it's a kind of boutique experience for him, uh, but by, by and large is, overwhelmingly accepted as part of the rubric of what makes up Black America. And he was accepted by Black people. Uh, and so I think that says something really significant about who he is. I, I was also struck by the um, Jeremiah Wright comments uh, where he seemed genuinely hurt um, mm -hmm. by, by what happened uh, when, you know, as a, as a politician, Obama had to, had to push him to the side in order mm -hmm. to to put that episode behind. And Wright, I think he understood, but there was real pain <laughs> in, in those, yeah. when, when he's recounting what uh, his relationship with Obama. And, and I, that's again, complicated, right? It was complicated. And I mean, I think that the pain was legitimate. You know, when I was working, I wrote a book uh, that came out in the course of the first term. Uh, and when I was talking with people, I didn't get a chance to talk with Wright, but I did talk with people who were close to Wright. Uh, and, you know, there was this, real feeling that he had been wounded uh, by the whole Obama affair. And, you know, not only that, it, it lent itself to a kind of mercenary idea about Obama, uh, that you could read his life and, you know, going from Occidental to Columbia, going from uh, Columbia to the South Side of Chicago, to Harvard Law, to all, all of these places, that it almost seemed uh, to be scripted. You know, that this was a person who was plotting a particular kind of rise. Uh, I, I don't know that that really holds up. And it seems that his relationship with Jeremiah Wright was 
uh, you know, indeed a sincere one, but an, and an authentic one. But critics of his at that point, and not all of them might, you know, certainly not most of them might at this point. In, in the film, Laura Washington says, you don't write a book, a, an autobiography at 30 if you don't have a plan. Right. And, <laughs> and I think that, you know, the idea of him having a plan was maybe something people could live with. But I mean, if you pick your church based on what's politically feasible for you, then you know, maybe it says something else about this person. And, you know, again, I, I can't say that that's true or not true, but it certainly became one of the things that Obama's critics seized upon. Uh, and, you know, subsequently, all the way through his presidency, uh, when people had disagreements with him, when they talked about his limitations in particular ways, they would go back to Jeremiah Wright. It's like, well, you see what happened in that moment and, and so on. Yeah, and, and I, we should, oh, sorry, go ahead, Peter, please. I'm gonna add to what Jelani said, which which when we arrived at his house to do the interview, he, he, while the camera was being set up, I sat at the kitchen table with him. He was deeply hurt. He had mm. never spoken out about this before. He, he was nervous about speaking, it at, speaking with us. Uh, he felt that his whole life's reputation was kind of uh, destroyed by this event that he'd never be seen for what he had done prior to the to the tapes mm, mm -hmm. and and at the end of the interview i i said to him what would what would you like to say to obama if you you know you, I mean, he hadn't spoke to him since and he said i'd just like to speak to him he, he he felt wounded he felt hurt and he felt like he missed a friend so it was a kind of a combination of deep hurt and and love that had been kind of pushed aside and he'd like to kind of try to bring it back. Uh, it, it, it was very moving to sit across from him. I, I was also, I mean, I was struck by the, the how much some of the, the, particularly the political figures struggled. Uh, people whose, you know, reputations are, uh, you know, are, are stellar, you know, I mean, John Lewis, uh, the, the the footage you have of him talking about his struggle with, you know, a, a bit kind of abandoning the Clintons, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and and moving towards supporting Obama, and how much he struggled with that. Uh, you know, Lewis is as close to a secular saint as we get, uh, and and he 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 seemed you know m you know really str to struggle even years past uh, with, with the kind of loyal, the, you know, the demonstration of loyalty there. I lived in John Lewis's district uh, at that time. And the amount of uh, criticism he received was titanic. Uh, you know, his district went overwhelmingly for Barack Obama. And he had this very longstanding personal relationship with the Clintons. Uh, and I think it was just you know, being in one paradigm while another paradigm is taking root. Uh, in you know, the traditional sense of it, black politicians were trying to uh, build up a favor bank, you know, have people who owe you favors and you know, develop these relationships and uh, with powerful influential whites. And here's this person, a kind of model of doing business politically that nobody had conceived of before. And it was easier for uh, John Lewis's district to immediately say that they were interested in Obama, uh, in a, it was easier for them than it was for John Lewis, you know, because John Lewis had built up, and not only him, you know, but you know, lots of other really respected people and, and honorable people who were banking on a Hillary Clinton presidency as a means of cashing in 10 or 15 or 20 years of political capital that they had built up. Uh, and so you understood the political calculations of it. Uh, and at the same time, you saw the historic implications of what was happening. Uh, and ultimately John Lewis came around as most people did, came around to supporting Obama. Uh, but that uh, period, especially in the primaries uh, in 2008 uh, was very tense. And even when he went around in the district and was just kind of the normal, uh, tides of praise that he would get when now mixed in with criticism about, oh, well, you really should be supporting Senator Obama. Uh, and also speaking of Atlanta, uh, I couldn't help but notice uh, it because I'm a complete nerd when it comes to politics, <laughs> that when uh, in the scenes, uh, when, when you all are, are filming election night, 
uh, at the Ebenezer uh, Church in Atlanta, Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, church, that there is one point where, you know, that they're about to announce that Obama is the projected winner. And there is a person standing at the preacher's dais who kind of jerks his head like this real quick. And that is current yeah. Senator Raphael right. Warnock, uh, yeah. a Democrat from Georgia who won uh, one of the two Georgia uh, uh, runoffs in, in January and gave the Democrats uh, a 50-50 Senate in the majority uh, because of Biden and Kamala Harris's win. So um, I, I don't know if that was intentional, if you had that uh, in, in the mind to, to, to make sure you got Warnock in there. Uh, again, this, this stuff is in post-production for a while, but my hat is off as, a, as somebody who covers Congress to get the, the uh, junior senator from uh, uh, I Georgia there. I missed that. <laughs> oh yeah, well it's it's in there. It's in there. <laughs> well, Peter, uh, Peter, uh, you didn't miss that. That was totally <laughs> intentional. Remember, remember, we talked about it. <laughs> um, I uh, I'm what one thing that I am I'm I'm curious about your you know your feelings about this because I, I mean we mentioned the you know this long overdue you know, true reckoning, I think, over over race, you know, we're talking about it in a way, particularly after Floyd's murder, that we hadn't, um, even though it has always been there in American politics. Um, but, you know, we have so much going on. I mean, you know, legislatures across the country are are contemplating voting restrictions. They pri That would primarily affect uh, uh, minority voters. Um, you know, we're we're debating. The Senate is going to debate uh, this uh, campaign elections overhaul bill. The Voting Rights Act is, you know, uh, was struck down by the Supreme Court, still not renewed by Congress, um, and and lurking, you know, in out there is is Donald Trump, uh, who again sort of weaponized uh, racism in, in politics. Um, what? What's this is a long question, and I apologize. But what is, what has happened? You know what what happened to us? Is is this the backlash to Obama uh, that we've been dealing with the last five years? And especially, you know, is 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 the are are the restrictions on voting eligibility and so forth? Are is this just a long, you know, sort of retrograde you know retrograde reaction to to Obama's presidency? I'll just say a short. A short answer and let Jelani give you the in-depth analysis. But yeah, I think there was a backlash to Obama. And I think the day he was was uh, elected, the backlash began. I think it it grew steadily and and culminated in the election of Donald Trump. And I think uh, once once Trump was uh, in office, all kinds of things were allowed to surface and come out. Uh, but it's probably, I mean, if you look at the longer his, historical span of time, it's probably one of many backlashes over, over centuries that, that uh, it's an unresolved issue that, uh, uh, I mean, I, I've, been reading, I've been reading over the past few weeks about how Texas, for instance, is, is changing its textbooks to change the narrative of of, of race in Texas history. And to me, that's just a small example of how, how misinformation gets conveyed from one generation to the next and the problems don't get fixed. They get continued by, by uh, children just like they're fo following their parents. So I, I think it's a much bigger backlash, but I think it truly came out now because of our first black president. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I think Peter's right. Uh, you know, what we were um, looking at in 2008 was intoxicating, you know, as we saw this political development happen that I think nobody anticipated. And at the same time, I had a conversation uh, with a number of conversations where people, even in that moment, were wary of what the implications of it would be. Uh, and people in the civil rights community were worried about the future of the Voting Rights Act, which turned out to be prescient. Uh, you know, in Obama's second term, we saw the Supreme Court gut the Voting Rights Act and even cite his election as a rationale for gutting uh, the Civil Rights Act. Uh, and so, you know, that happens. We see, 
a weaponization of race that really begins uh, in his second term, politically speaking, and only gains steam from there, uh, gains momentum from there. Uh, not to be overlooked as part of this backlash is, I think, the high profile incidents of racial violence uh, that we've seen, you know, the mass shootings, you know, most notably at Emanuel AME, uh, but you know, subsequently uh, at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh and at the Walmart in El Paso, you know, getting into the Trump era uh, and uh, Charlottesville, uh, the racist motifs that we saw in the January 6th uh, insurrection. Uh, and so there's a kind of stations of the cross effect in looking at all the things that came from Obama and in understanding the history of race in this country and how it operates, we should not have been surprised by any of it. Um, but it's, it's disconcerting uh, nonetheless to see ourselves caught up in the same cycl cyclical uh, recurrence of racial violence, racial antagonism, restriction uh, on rights, uh, impeding access to the ballot box and all of it being done while still referring to ourselves as uh, the benchmark democracy in the world. And I, I'm going to have to wrap up. Uh, I, I do want to say that I, I feel like the this um, no no documentary uh, or or book uh, is, is going to explain things or or set things right. But like I, I have to say that this what what you all have accomplished with this um, with this documentary series with the focus on on Obama and particularly the way that it's framed with with the. Um, that that particular speech about race, I think it, it will stand as a as a, a real marker for how we look at uh, race and politics. And my uh, hat is off to you for your accomplishment, and thank you very much for for uh, for talking about your project. You. I'm going to hand it back to Ken Jacobson now at AFI. Thanks so much, Jason, and thanks, Jelani, and thank you, Peter, and congratulations again on the film, and thanks to our audience for watching this Q and A. Uh, we do want to uh, invite all of you out there to please tell all your friends uh, that this film is available to screen until the end of the festival. We'd love to hear from you on social media at hashtag AFI Docs. And please do check out all of our virtual events and great films at docs.afi.com. Thanks, everyone.